please come. I need you. This is our immediate our life or death situation. I was so heated up with anger. I just kept stabbing and stabbing and stabbing her, and I, I, I took off her head. This disturbingly calm call was made by 25-year-old Jessica Camilleri in Sydney, Australia, on the evening of July 20th, 2019. Though her tone doesn't indicate it, something straight out of a nightmare had just occurred moments before Jessica called for help. When the emergency services arrived at the home where Jessica was living with her 57-year-old mother, Rita Camilleri, they found Rita on the kitchen floor. Well, most of her. Her decapitated and mutilated head was discovered on the footpath near her home. She'd suffered from a brutal attack and been stabbed multiple times with several different knives, four of which actually broke during the attack. She also had numerous defensive wounds. Yet in the call to emergency services, Jessica claimed that her mother had attacked her and that she had acted in self-defense. So did she just say her mom tried to stab her? I don't know because of the... Yes. Yeah. Not. And I, in self-defense, I think I killed her. Even more chilling was Jessica's claim that she thought she may have accidentally killed Rita when it was clear to emergency responders that Rita was far beyond any chance of help by the time the call was made, never mind when they actually arrived. This clearly wasn't a case of self-defense. So what had happened between the mother and daughter to end in such a disturbing and tragic way? Well, Rita was widely known to have a heart of gold, and always put other people before her, such as her youngest daughter, Jessica. Rita took Jessica in after she'd been struggling recently, though in truth, she'd been troubled for much of her life. Rita took it upon herself to care for Jessica, believing that her love could contain and protect her daughter. Just before her death, Rita had become even more overly protective and defensive of Jessica. It doesn't sound like the kind of mother-daughter relationship that could end the way it did, does it? Well, you see, Jessica has multiple mental health diagnoses, including an intellectual disability and intermittent explosive disorder, which often manifested in what a psychiatrist described as rage attacks. She also was diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. While aggression can be common in individuals on the autism spectrum, it's important to note that extreme violence, such as what Jessica exhibited, is not caused by autism. However, her unusual behavior after the killing and her overall lack of emotion in the 911 call could be explained somewhat by her autism diagnosis. Intermittent explosive disorder, on the other hand, is characterized by an individual having aggressive impulses that result in serious assaults or destruction of property. There is no planning involved in these attacks. Instead, the person reacts quickly out of anger. Jessica had a long history of violent outbursts and an obsession with horror movies, such as Jeepers Creepers and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. She often shared her love for all things horror related to Facebook, including a story from Texas about a shadowy creature with huge wings. Highly restricted, fixated interests with abnormal intensity is a common symptom of autism. Some of Jessica's more concerning outbursts involved harassing local businesses, her family members, and even people she didn't know by threatening them over the phone. A few of those threats included Jessica saying that she would cut off someone's head with a knife. Yikes. Sounds a bit too familiar, doesn't it? Still, Rita was determined to seek help from every doctor and psychiatrist she thought could aid Jessica. When all of that failed and her daughter continued to struggle, a desperate Rita even turned to an unlikely source, a medium. For a sum of $5,000, the medium promised to get the demon out of Jessica. Rita paid $2,500, but never received any kind of service. To make matters worse, about three months before Rita's death, Jessica had been refusing to take any prescribed medication. Instead, she sought help from natural alternatives, though these were never specified. The exact medications Jessica was prescribed is unknown, but it can be dangerous to suddenly stop taking psychotropic drugs because it can cause symptoms to increase. There was no denying that Rita cared very deeply for Jessica, so on that fateful evening when she became concerned about her deteriorating behavior, she called for an ambulance to come to the home. Jessica wrestled for the phone with her mother, apparently out of fear that she was going to be returned to a mental institution after having spent time in one previously. It's believed that Jessica knocked Rita to the floor and then dragged her to the kitchen by her hair where she killed her. Even though Jessica had confessed to the killing during the emergency call, and also to the police who arrived at the scene, Jessica didn't show any remorse for what had happened. While in custody, she continued to blame Rita, 
claiming the savage attack was all self-defense. She, she had enough of me. She grabbed me by the hair and dragged me from my room all the way to the kitchen. And she got a knife and she tried to stab me with it. And I grabbed the knife off her because I thought she was going to stab me. So I stabbed her back. And I was so heated up with anger. I just kept stabbing and stabbing and stabbing her. And I, I, I took off her head. Jessica only changed her tune once she began undergoing psychiatric examinations while in custody. It was then that she wrote a letter to her family which read, I know it's all my fault that my mother isn't here. It didn't hit me at first, then it hit me like a ton of bricks, like a mountain. However, though that may sound like remorse, during an examination, Jessica also likened herself to a butcher and cited the movie The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It's unclear exactly what she said about the movie, except that she told the psychiatrist to write this down for the judge, and that she was thinking sick thoughts at the time of her mother's death. This disturbing tale became even more twisted when in court, it was revealed that Jessica and Rita hadn't been alone in the house that night. A four-year-old child, known only as Child A, had also been with them. Not only that, but the child actually witnessed Jessica's savage attack, and even attempted to stop her by jumping on her. Jessica wounded the child when she knocked them away. It's unknown who the child was to read our Jessica, nor why they were in the house, but apparently Jessica referred to them as the little bastard. The evaluations determined that Jessica had intended to kill her mother and then fabricated a version of events to deflect her culpability. Still, she pleaded not guilty to murdering her mother by claiming that she was mentally impaired at the time. At trial, Jessica's defense followed this by stating that she had an abnormality of mind despite also acknowledging that she had intended to kill her mother that day. The judge didn't buy it. Not only did the judge say that Jessica knew what she was doing was wrong, but that by beheading her mother after she died, she was indulging in a sort of macabre curiosity, inspired by her obsession with horror movies. Jessica's 911 call goes against the theory of mental impairment. She lied about the state her mother was in and was lucid enough to try to argue self-defense. Her sister, Christy Teresi, told the court that she would never forgive Jessica for what she did, saying Rita was killed and butchered like she was nothing, all because of a fit of rage at the selfish hands of my own sister. Due to her underlying psychiatric conditions and significant mental impairment, Jessica was found guilty of manslaughter rather than murder, though the judge said that this case was the most serious example of manslaughter a court could consider. Jessica Camilleri was sentenced to a maximum of 21 years and seven months, and will not be eligible for parole for 16 years and two months. She could be imprisoned until 2041. Hearing the sentence, Rita's family members started crying and thanked the court. Tips to prevent similar attacks. If you have a loved one who has extreme aggressive outbursts, encourage them to seek help from a mental health professional. Learning coping skills, as well as how to resolve interpersonal conflicts and manage feelings of anger are all possible benefits of therapy. If you're a caretaker for an individual with serious mental health diagnoses and or someone who exhibits violent behavior, enlist help. Having a good support system of family and friends, doctors, and mental health professionals can take some of the caregiving weight off you and help ensure your own safety. Always consult with a doctor if the individual you're caring for is refusing medications, displaying increased violent behavior, or making threats. Now, you may assume that this story ends here, but not quite. After being placed in a prison in Sydney, in the woman's prison's toughest unit, Jessica began wreaking havoc there. In a situation eerily similar to what happened to Rita, Jessica, reportedly in a fit of rage, grabbed another inmate by her hair and attacked her because she was hungry. Though Jessica may be one of the most dangerous inmates there, she was arguably outdone by another woman who shares those same halls, Australia's female Hannibal Lecter. A depraved story we're getting into next. Before we start, I'll warn you that if you're squeamish, this next case has some graphic descriptions of a crime that haunted the police first on the scene for the rest of their lives, so much so that most took stress leaves after to cope with what they saw. The peaceful New South Wales town of Aberdeen in Northwest Australia was rocked by a horrific scene that would eventually shake the entire country. 44-year-old John Price was known as a friendly neighbor and an overall nice guy around the community, so it was highly unusual when he didn't make it to work on March 1st, 2000. One of his colleagues decided to check on him and stopped by his house. However, they knew something horrific had happened. 
when they spotted blood on the front door. John's co-worker immediately called the police. The authorities arrived at 8 a.m. There was no way that they could have ever prepared themselves for what they found. The first thing they noticed was a pool of blood in the hallway just beyond the door, which spread throughout the rest of the house. Except for the ominous presence of blood, nothing else looked amiss at first. They then discovered that the dinner table had been left perfectly set for the next meal, steaks with vegetables already laid out on the plates. But it was what the police found in the next two rooms that they would never be able to forget. There's no way to say this except that sitting in a large pot on the kitchen stove was a human head nestled among the cooking vegetables. Baking in the oven were parts of a body. Now, that would stop anyone in their tracks, but somehow it got even worse as the police continued on. In the living room, they found human skin hanging from a beam on the roof. The victim was none other than John Price. As you can imagine, this horrific scene wasn't something the investigators would be able to forget. The grotesque remains were not the only shocking discoveries in the House of Horrors. Catherine Mary Knight, John's girlfriend of four years, was also found asleep on the bed. Catherine, a worker at a slaughterhouse, was allegedly discovered unconscious from the medication she'd taken. As the investigation got underway, it was revealed that John had been stabbed multiple times with a butcher's knife and with considerable expertise and an obviously steady hand. However, due to the savage nature of the attack, it was difficult to count the exact number of wounds. Still, the evidence told a disturbing story. Because the pod where John's head was found was still warm, it appeared that he had been killed middle of the night on February 29th. The blood also indicated that the attack had begun while he was lying in bed. He was struck or stabbed, but tried to escape down the hall towards the front door. John actually managed to make it outside, which is how blood ended up on the door. But whoever was attacking him charged him and dragged him back inside, where he died after bleeding out from his many wounds. One thing that was enormously clear to investigators was that this evil crime, one that would echo in Australia's history, had been planned, and the killer knew exactly what they were doing. Given the amount of gory evidence, Catherine was charged almost immediately, though she was first treated at a hospital for the near overdose from the medication she'd taken before being moved to a psychiatric ward. But to everyone's surprise, Catherine claimed that she had no memory at all of what happened that night. She claimed that the last thing she remembered was watching TV and then nothing else. To most who knew her, Catherine was often regarded as friendly and someone who loved socializing at the local pub. She was also known to be a good worker at her job at the slaughterhouse. But in her private life, she hid a dark secret. Catherine had previously been married to David Kellett, a truck driver, and the couple had two children. David said that Catherine was frequently unpredictably violent, which is one reason their marriage ended. Catherine went on to have two more children with two other men before she started dating John Price. The relationship was rocky from the very beginning, mostly due to Catherine's explosive temper. After a few years together, Catherine was overheard demanding a share of John's house and telling him, quote, You'll never get me out of this house. I'll do you in first. Now, if that's not ominous enough, just five months before John was killed, Catherine told her brother, I'm going to kill Pricey and I'm going to get away with it. I'll get away with it because I'll make out I'm mad. There were a few red flags, okay, a lot of blatantly obvious signs that something bad could happen, and yet no one took Catherine's threat seriously enough to go to the authorities. That is, until Sunday the 27th, just two days before John died. John and Catherine had a vicious fight where Catherine threatened him with a butcher's knife, though some sources say she'd actually done more than that and stabbed him with it. Either way, the fight was bad enough that the police were called, and they interviewed both Catherine and John. However, because the two gave conflicting stories, the case was left unresolved, something that those responding officers would regret for years to come. John left home to stay at his friend's house, and the day after the fight, he went to the Scone Court Chamber Magistrate to seek an apprehended domestic personal violence order, basically the Australian version of a restraining order. But by then, it was far too late. Catherine had already decided what she was going to do. With all of this in mind, the question was not if Catherine had killed John. That much was obvious. The debate became whether or not she was sane when she did it. Evidence in this debate was the fact that she dropped off her two youngest children to stay with her adult daughter, which was seen as premeditation. 
Not only that, but the way she left the house indicated that she had planned and grotesquely enjoyed what she did. At some point after killing and skinning John, Catherine went into the kitchen and peeled and prepared vegetables, which she cooked alongside John's head in a large pot to make a sickening stew. Police suspect that it was the skill she honed at work that allowed her the precision to mutilate John. Then Catherine carefully set the table with horrendously gruesome entrees, steaks made from John's legs and buttocks, along with the notes addressed to John's two children with the intention of feeding the revolting meal to the unsuspecting kids. A small mercy was that she was thankfully stopped by police before this ever happened. It's possible that Catherine was doing exactly what she told her brother months ago that she was going to do, kill Pricey and get away with it because I'll make out I'm mad. Though this is speculation, she may have been trying to appear crazy by setting up such an appalling scene with John's body parts. The psychiatrist who assessed Catherine determined that she understood what she did was wrong, but that she simply didn't care. One psychiatrist even remarked, callousness is not an absence of knowledge of what is right or wrong. They diagnosed Catherine with a borderline personality disorder and determined that despite doing something truly evil and depraved, she was sane. Catherine Knight was found legally fit to stand trial. While at trial in 2001, she first pleaded not guilty, but ended up pleading guilty after the judge said that the graphic evidence would likely cause distress to any potential jurors and result in them being discharged. At her sentencing, the judge decided that Catherine was an ongoing risk to the community, and she became the first Australian woman to be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. We can all let out a sigh of relief that Australia's female Hannibal Lecter will never be released from prison. Identifying a Violent Partner If your partner has a history of violence toward previous partners, know that it is possible, and perhaps likely, that they will at some point be violent toward you. If your partner makes threats of violence towards you, consider that these words may turn into actions. The level of partner violence often increases over time. It may start off as verbal threats, throwing furniture, punching walls, but it may then escalate to hitting you, choking you, or as in this case, stabbing. Be aware that leaving a violent partner is the riskiest time. If you feel that you may be in danger, do not return to a shared home alone as that could put you in a very vulnerable position. As hard as it may be to start over with nothing, Remember that no possession is worth your life. In the USA, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE-7233 or text START to 88788. Our final case today is an ominous reminder that you can't always trust the people you meet over the internet. Even if they seem harmless, they may be harboring some unimaginably dark desires. Though 23-year-old Bobby Joe Stinnett from Skidmore, Missouri, worked at the Kawasaki Manufacturing Plant in nearby Maryville, her true passion came from raising and breeding dogs. It was the kind of thing that only people who really got it understood, which is likely why Bobby Joe found herself reaching out to like-minded people online. She became active as part of an online chat room devoted to the niche love of showing and breeding rat terrier dogs called Ratter Chatter. In December of 2004, Bobby Joe was not only expecting a litter of puppies, which she excitedly told the group about in the hopes of selling them, but she was also eight months pregnant herself. It was then that she met Darlene Fisher, who approached her online, saying she wanted to buy a dog. The two began talking and quickly bonded over a coincidence. Darlene was also pregnant. With two things in common, a love for rat terriers and both expecting babies soon, the women became fast friends. Since Darlene was going to buy a puppy from Bobby Joe, the two decided to finally meet in person at Bobby Joe's house on December 16th, where Darlene would also pick up her puppy. About an hour after the two women were supposed to meet, Bobby Joe's mother, Becky Harper, stopped over at her daughter's house. Instead of being greeted by her kind and bubbly daughter, she was horrified to find blood everywhere. She found Bobby Joe lying dead on the floor, Bobby Joe's husband, Zeb, had been working at the time and broke down when he was told his wife had been killed. When investigators arrived, they uncovered that along with all of the blood in the home, Bobby Joe had been attacked and strangled to death with a neon pink rope. As completely tragic as Bobby Joe's death was, there was another concern. What about her baby? 
Well, this is where the story takes a particularly gruesome turn. There was no sign of the baby, which is why there was so much blood. It appeared as though whoever had killed Bobby Joe had then cut the baby from her womb using a kitchen knife. Who would commit such a horrific and depraved crime to actually steal a baby from a pregnant woman? Well, it didn't take long for the police to zero in on a suspect, the last person to see Bobby Joe, her internet friend Darlene. But here's the thing, Darlene Fisher didn't exist. That is, it was a fake name. Why would someone use a false name on an internet website like a rat terrier group? Well, as it would turn out, someone who saw a gruesome opportunity. The problem was, how do you find someone who doesn't exist? Investigators began examining Bobby Joe's computer and found emails from Darlene, or rather, someone pretending to be Darlene. Tracking the emails, they discovered that they came from a woman named Lisa Marie Montgomery, living in Melvern, Kansas. The day after Bobby Joe was killed, investigators stormed 36-year-old Lisa's farmhouse to find her sitting calmly in the living room with a newborn baby in her arms. When they confronted her about Bobby Joe's death, Lisa was adamant that she wasn't involved. In fact, she said she simply couldn't have been involved because she had gone into labor while she was out shopping, making it impossible for her to have been in Skidmore. Her husband backed up her story. The police weren't convinced, not even for a second. They arrested Lisa and took the child from her, returning the baby to Zeb Stennett. Now, if this seems hasty, the detectives had one very good reason to suspect the baby wasn't Lisa's, but actually Bobby Joe's. Even though Lisa's husband believed she'd gone into labor the day before, he hadn't actually been with her. No one had. That seems pretty suspicious, but if there was any doubt about the investigator's decision, as it turns out, Lisa's own mother and sister revealed that it was actually impossible for her even to have children. After the birth of her fourth child in 1990, she'd undergone a tubal ligation. Tubal ligation is also known as having your tubes tied and is a form of permanent birth control, making it unlikely that Lisa could become pregnant again. But despite this, over the years, she had repeatedly told her husband that she was pregnant, who appeared to not be aware that she had tubal ligation and believed her claims. It's been assumed that she eventually told him she miscarried to explain why she never actually had another child. As it turned out, in 2004, Lisa had once again been pretending to be pregnant. So when she showed up with a baby, her husband didn't ask any questions and assumed she'd been telling the truth. A DNA test later confirmed that the baby was Bobby Joe's, and the little girl was named Victoria Joe after her deceased mother. With this discovery, Lisa was charged with Bobby Joe's death. When the case went to court, Lisa's defense tried to argue that at the time of the killing, she was suffering from delusions and couldn't distinguish right from wrong. Lisa had depression, borderline personality disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder after suffering from years of abuse as a child, which her defense claimed brought on a dissociative psychosis. She was also diagnosed to be suffering from the extremely rare condition of pseudosiasis, where a woman's belief that she's pregnant, even when not, actually triggers hormonal and physical changes to her body, as though she's really pregnant. Dissociative disorders or dissociative psychosis can occur following major trauma as a way for the individual to escape from reality. As a child, Lisa experienced abhorrent abuse and assault. As a result of the abuse, she suffered from a traumatic brain injury. The ongoing abuse as a child would have had a huge effect on her development. While the trauma she experienced certainly doesn't excuse the horrific attack on Bobby Joe, it may provide some explanation as to how she ended up doing what she did. Despite this, it was uncovered that before meeting Bobby Joe under the guise of wanting to buy a puppy from her, Lisa had been researching home births and how to perform cesarean sections online so that she would be able to cut out Bobby Joe's baby without harming it. Lisa had also traveled over 80 miles to Bobby Joe's house and back, all so that she could pass the child off as her own. It was obvious that Lisa was guilty, but the question was, could she be tried and held legally culpable? The case made national headlines as people debated whether or not Lisa should be held accountable for her actions, given the abuse she had suffered and her mental health. The answer came on October 22, 2007, when a jury found Lisa Montgomery guilty. Just a few days later, she was sentenced to death. Her defense immediately responded, arguing that executing her would be a cruel and unusual punishment because of her mental state. This is because the Constitution forbids the execution of anyone who is unable to rationally understand their execution. In fact, one of her attorneys spoke publicly and said that Lisa had deteriorated significantly since her arrest and had completely lost touch with reality. 
Over the years, Lisa has made multiple attempts to have her execution date postponed. On two separate occasions, she was successful, but at 52 years old, Lisa Montgomery was executed by the federal government on January 13, 2021. She was the first female federal inmate to be put to death in almost 70 years. While the internet can be a great way to connect with people from all over the world with similar interests, there are definitely some risks involved when choosing to meet an online friend in person. Here are a few tips to help you stay safe. Meet in a public place. Do not meet at a house or a hotel room, as that can be too secluded. Think twice before giving online friends your home address. Do not get into a car with an online friend you just met. If they're driving, they're in control and could take you anywhere. If you're driving, they could pull out a weapon and force you to drive anywhere. Consider having a trusted friend or family member either come to the initial meeting with you or to be in close proximity. If you decide to meet your online friend alone, make sure that a friend or family member knows where you are, who you're meeting, and when you plan to return. So, what became of Bobby Joe's daughter? Well, the little girl survived the horror of her birth and grew into a healthy teenager living with her family in the Skidmore area. Her father and grandmother do their best to make sure she has a normal life. However, her birthday has also been surrounded by tragedy, and it falls on the anniversary of her mother's death. 